Doctors are respected members of society who are supposed to be healers, but some are pure evil. This plastic surgeon was headed to surgery when police found meth in his truck. This intoxicated doc treated the interstate like a racetrack. And an oncologist turned online predator attempted to meet up with a 13-year-old girl. You're talking about being concerned for her, and you're asking her, will you suck me? And uh, I want you to taste me. Did you say that? I don't know. Here are five times when evil doctors realize they've been caught. It's too tight to pull your hands. Can you a second that? Dr. William Wright Adams. Our first case involves Dr. William Wright Adams, who was arrested in St. Petersburg, Florida on June 24, 2022, on a suspected burglary charge. But the situation quickly escalated into something much more serious. An undercover officer arrives on the scene while the arrest is in progress, and he'll soon be glad he did. We can 15 him right away. I'll explain everything, okay? Dr. Adams tries to explain that not only has he done nothing wrong, he's heading to perform surgery. But the cuffs go on and he's not going anywhere. Okay, that's fine. This is more important right now. Thank you. All right. Just too tight to pull your hands. Adams is a popular plastic surgeon in St. Petersburg who has an arrest for possession of methamphetamine on his sheet. Luckily for him, the charge was dropped, but he clearly didn't learn his lesson, and now he's back in custody. Operating where are you? I'm a plastic surgeon. Okay, where at? My office. Where's that at? On Ninth Avenue. Okay. You got anything in your pockets or anything? I don't think so. I'll check. I'll check. Uh -huh. The officer searches Adam's truck, looking for anything to make this stop worth his while. It's a little late to work today. Yeah, I know. The doc again tries to talk his way out of the situation by telling the officer that a patient is being sedated and prepped for surgery and he has to be allowed to go. The officer doesn't take the bait. Instead, one of his fellow officers calls his office to inform them Adams won't be making any of his appointments. Okay. Put somebody to sleep right now for okay. me to operate on. Okay. So I have to call Would you them like me to I, call I them and there. tell them? Uh, or are they going to do that when you show up? They're all waiting for me right now. Okay, so I'm are sorry. they doing the medicine prior to you showing up? Sedation probably somewhat. Usually yes, they, yes or no, because I'll make a call over yeah, there. Yes, please call. Okay. He still hasn't been told why he's been arrested, but he's smart enough to know that he shouldn't say anything before talking to his lawyer. I know you probably have uh, no clue what's going on right now, but I think you have a uh, perspective of what I'm going to bring up that I would appreciate um, statements for. Um, that's up to you. Um, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can or will be used against you in the court of law. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have him or her present with you while you are being questioned. If you cannot afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you. You could decide at any time to exercise these rights and not answer any questions or make any statements. Having these rights in mind, do you wish to talk to me now? Uh, I would, my attorney, Kevin Hazley. Okay, you want your attorney present? Yes, sir. Okay. Adams must be getting anxious watching the officer take out the latex gloves. His leather bag is about to be searched and he's really going to need his lawyer. The officer takes a closer look at the meth pipe he pulled out of one of the bank deposit bags and drops it in an evidence bag. Then the smoking gun is found, a bag that contains what appears to be meth. That might be a game over for Mr. Adams. Do you have a meth test kit? If not, I might have it in my truck. He finally gets to speak with his lawyer, and obviously he's instructed not to answer any questions until his lawyer arrives at the precinct. How are you, Kevin Hazlett here? Good, uh, Kevin. Just talking to your sergeant. I'm just gonna, if you could do me a favor, just put it on speaker. Here's what we're gonna do. I talked to the sergeant, who's a nice young lady, 
what we're going to do at this point is we're going to invoke your rights against self-incrimination. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to speak to the right people at the right time. Just today is not the time. So I'm going to ask you not to answer any more of the questions. They're not going to ask you any more questions. Let's go ahead and, and just, uh, we'll, I'll connect with you. I will get you bonded out of jail this afternoon. It will take probably till 3 or 4 o'clock today. They've got to book you. They're going to take you. This process uh -huh. takes some time. The latex gloves go back on, and the officer continues to dig for evidence that will bury Adams. He got off on a possession charge once, and he's doing everything he can to make sure it doesn't happen again. The idea of a drug-addicted surgeon operating on people is a scary thought. Yeah. After all, the evidence found in his vehicle is collected. He's taken back to the jail to settle in for a very long afternoon while he awaits for his lawyer. Yeah, that will go all back in here. Do you want them to bring your backpack? Adams hasn't been cleared as a suspect in the burglary case and is awaiting trial for his second crystal meth possession charge. It's highly unlikely he'll ever perform surgery again, and the public should have a sigh of relief just like they should have after the arrest in our next case. Three. Dr. Terry Hansen. Our second case involves the arrest of Dr. Terry Hansen, who was pulled over for speeding in New Mexico just before 10 p.m. on December 3rd, 2021. He was later charged with a DWI. Driving down the interstate, a Porsche blows by the officer traveling more than 115 miles per hour. The officer catches up with the vehicle and a red light and soon pulls him over. He's shocked by the audacity of the driver, who has no explanation for why he was driving so fast. Hello. How are you doing? Great. I'm Austin Wilhelm New Mexico State Police. You understand the reason why I'm stopping you? Not really, actually. I have no idea. No. Okay. It's time for Terry to step out so we can see what's really going on here. Terry doesn't seem to care about the well-being of his passengers at all. And one of them is his girlfriend. Terry, I'm going to have you step on out, okay? I just have to ask a few more questions. Any weapons, knives, guns, anything I need no, to know about? Sir. Cool. Can I have you walk in front of my uniform, please, sir? Sure. Okay. There's families over here trying to celebrate, you know, get ready, going to the light of the tree and all that, trying to get home. What if you hit them at 160 miles an hour? You know what I mean? Okay, I don't know who these people are inside your vehicle. You probably know them, right? My girlfriend and her friend. You probably care about them, right? Yes, I do. Just imagine hurting them seriously. First it was one beer, then it was two. That's not a good story. And it opened the door for the officer to conduct a field sobriety test. Two, like two beers and that's it. Two beers? But I'm not, yeah. Okay, the reason why I'm asking is like smoke. I appreciate the honesty. The two beers and ten of beers. Yeah. I have dark beers. Dark beers and that was at dinner? Yes, at Fogarty Chow. The officer conducts a very extended version of the eye test to make sure he gets a clear picture of Terry's state. You're going to eat your men in that position there, do you understand? I'm going to have you stare at the tip of my right index finger with your eyes, but do not move your head. Okay. Any questions? No. Completely understand my Absolutely. instructions? See my finger? Yes, I do. Follow my finger with your yes, eyes, do. and do not move your head, do you understand? The balance test is one that matters most. This is where Dr. Hansen's fate will be decided by the officer. What most people don't know is that the tests don't have objective pass or fail criteria. Officers are allowed to exercise their best judgment in determining whether someone is impaired after taking the test. Okay, sir. Are those shoes comfortable to walk in? Yes. All right, I'm going to have you stand right here on this white line. We're going to utilize this white line. Okay. There's no major cracks or anything like that. It's going to twist your ankle. So what I'm going to have you do, would you like to remove your shoes? You would like to... Uh, no, my walk. shoes are fine. All right. So you're okay. going to look downward at your feet. Sure. Count each step out loud, touch heel to toe on each step, and keep your hands directly to the side at all times. The officer does a great job of stalling by repeating his instructions over and over. Terry's balance is strained before the test even begins. I'm guessing that's not the doctor's best work, but he's allowed to continue. Can I took three steps. How many steps are you going to take? Nine, sir. Okay. Once you start this test, you cannot stop until it's completed okay. fully. All right. Do you have any questions? No, sir. No questions at all? Nope. Go ahead and begin, sir. Okay. So this is one. Two, 
three, two, two, facing back. Remember you had to take nine steps back? Oh, nine steps back, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, after making his case to the officer that he's fine to drive home, the officer disagrees and places him under arrest. All right, put your hand on your back, Terry. Okay. Do not move, okay? okay? At this time, which is 10 o'clock p.m., you are being arrested for DWI. Do you have anything that's going to stab me, poke me, or harm me in any way, sir? No. Nothing in your pockets? No. Can you spread your feet for me, please? The officer isn't able to answer the doctor's simple question and simply repeats the paragraph that he asked for clarification on. So what it's saying is, if you refuse the test, you will lose your New Mexico driver's license for non-resident operating privilege for one year. Automatically. If you are convicted in court of driving If I'm convicted. One, if you are convicted in court of driving one, then But if I also, refuse a test and I'm not convicted, I don't lose my license. So that's ultimately, it's separated between two. There's an administrative side and there's also a criminal side. Okay. Okay. He asks the same question again, but the officer is still non-responsive, and they continue to talk in circles. Well, so, 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 so to be clear, I lose my license automatically by saying no to the test. I read it. No, but 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 uh, uh, you're saying that if I'm found guilty, I may lose my license. Doctor Hansen is told he's being charged with aggravated DWI and placed in the officer's car. So the officer plans to have the car towed, even though there's an able driver in the car. She's not the owner, so obviously the, the vehicle has to get towed, sir. Can I have a seat, please? Terry, please have a seat. No, he says he's going to tow the car. I'm going to need you to sit down or I'm going to have to get you in there. I don't want to do that, sir. You've been cool with me. I'm going to cool with you. The officer has already made his intentions very clear, so that intervention certainly wasn't helpful. And she's only getting started. I have can, no can you get back over there for me? I need to give him my phone number. So have a seat over here. I'll give you a phone. Give you two seconds. You're arresting him on no charges. Okay, ma'am. Can you have him go back over here for me? No, please? I will not. Ma'am, you're going to be clear. He's getting arrested for DWI. Why? Because I said, okay, go and have a seat I over there. I saw him back over there. I'm going to pay what you pay. The doctor's lady friend starts in on the officer's supervisor by questioning his actions, making the situation even more tense. It seems she may have had a few drinks herself. How are you? I'm good. Okay, well, if he he passed and he, then got he wouldn't arrested. be in handcuffs, right? I don't understand that. I saw him. Well, this is a very experienced DWI officer. Um, interesting. He's deemed the driver too impaired to safely drive, and he's going to jail. Okay. So I guess now we got to figure out how we're going to get you guys home. Um, yes, I need to get the driver my number so he can call me from jail. You can give it how to about me, that? and I can give it to him. Just five minutes later, the Uber arrives, and the doctor's friends head home. So negative. Yeah. All right, guys, you leave your phones on and stuff. Okay. Yep. At the precinct, Terry has the situation explained to him as he prepares for his breathalyzer test. He declines to take the test and asks what he needs to do to go home. But the consequences, you continue saying no. Do you have any questions on that regarding that now that we're in a controlled environment? It's no other out echoes. The back is just me and you talking. Do you have any questions on that? No, uh, in terms of, do I have any questions regarding what exactly? What, what I read you on the side of the room after I arrested you. Well, about the... The breath test. The breath test. Yes, sir. Um, no, I think we went over that enough. Uh, I mean, um, yeah. Uh, Terry makes sure he gets his two cents in and lets the officer know exactly how he feels about how he handled the situation before he's transferred to the west side of, for booking. Hansen pleaded guilty to DWI and was sentenced to six months of supervised probation. A speeding charge was dropped as a condition of the plea deal. The doctor in our next case wishes he got off that lightly. Sir, sir, I need to talk to you for a minute. Dr. Maurice Wolin. Our third case takes place in Petaluma, California and involves the arrest of 48-year-old oncologist Dr. Maurice Wolin. Wolin was targeted in a child sex sting organized by the police and the NBC television network as part of their To Catch a Predator series. Oh. 
He was charged with attempting lewd acts with a child under the age of 14. As you'll see, the evidence against him was overwhelming. Law enforcement officers swarm Dr. Wolin after he shows up at a Petuloma, California home, allegedly to have sex with a minor that he's been talking to online. They immediately took him into an RV they had set up as an interrogation room. The defeated doctor sits in the RV pondering his future, and after officer Steve Nelson introduces himself and reads him his Miranda rights, things get real fast. Okay, um, like I said, my name's Steve Nelson, I'm a detective with the Petaluma Police Department. Um, first thing I'm going to do is uh, explain to you your uh, Miranda rights, okay? Okay. He lawyers up and asks what the official charge is, and Officer Nelson is happy to oblige his request. I've never done anything wrong in my life. That's going to be a tough story to sell. Can you tell me what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Um, you're being charged with, uh, I believe, I believe uh, attempt lewd acts with a child under the age of 14 and uh, burglary. Burglary? Yes. Okay. Steve, I've never done anything wrong in my life. Ever. You know my record. Okay. The officer reminds him that he's already asked for an attorney, so he's not going to ask any further questions. But the disgraced doctor agrees to answer whatever questions he can while adding that he may refuse to answer some. It's a really dumb move on his part, but that shouldn't be too surprising. What did I take? Let me just stop you for a second. You asked to talk to an attorney. Yes. Okay. I'm not going to discuss this further because I can't. Okay. I will answer what I can. Okay. So again, I just want to make this clear that um, you do not wish to have an attorney present that you want to talk to me about what happened today. But I, I may decline to answer if I think it's incriminating. He proceeds to answer questions that will be used to bury him, and he seems to have no idea. But I'm also making clear that I'm not going to answer things that I think could damage me. What screen name do you go by? I use Tall Dreamy Dog. Okay. Is that uh, a Yahoo? Yes. Website? Okay. Why did you come to uh, the house in Petaluma today? I was curious. Okay. Curious about what? I chatted with someone online. She had asked to meet me. And how old was the, the person you were chatting with? I'm not sure. So she, you don't know? You don't remember? I don't remember. Okay. I know she was young, and I know that... Under 18? I'm not sure. Okay. How old are you? 48. 48? 48. Okay. Do you remember the, the, person, the name of the person that you were coming to visit? Willow. Willow. The male, female? Female. Female. I wonder what questions he would consider damaging. He's answering every question the officer is throwing at him like it's no big deal. Did you write it down, directions or anything that you... I wrote it down earlier okay. when she gave it to me. Okay. Is that in your car? I don't know. And what made you think that the girl was under 80, at the age of 18? I don't remember exactly what she said. I didn't intend to do anything because I didn't have any time and I was just, I was, to be quite honest with you, just curious. Okay. When you were chatting with her, um, do you remember her screen name? Positive. She messaged me a couple times, too. Okay. After nearly 10 minutes of laying out detail uh, after detail of his online encounters with the supposed young girl, he's removed any reasonable doubt that his actions were innocent and leaving no room for his lawyer to mount any kind of reasonable defense. And the more he talks, the more comfortable he gets. August 24th, you're chatting with her and you tell her, I'm Marco, by the way, in San Francisco. She said, thanks, I'm Willow. Okay. Um, I'm in the 707. I'm 13 female. What's your ASL? And then you say, oh goodness, I'm 29. Sorry. Is that accurate? I don't remember. But would that be accurate that you... I don't have, remember. I mean, does anybody else use your computer? I, I don't I don't know. I don't remember those, those words. I don't remember her okay. age. But obviously you knew she was under the age of 18, so... I knew that she was young. Did you ask her if she dated older guys? I don't remember. If he wanted to talk to his wife, he should have listened to the officer and kept his mouth shut. He made his bed and he stuck in it. Nelson, can I call my wife? Okay, you'd be able to call her when we're done, okay? He explains that he only came to the house because she begged him, but he certainly wasn't going to do anything. If you think it couldn't get any worse for him, it does. 
I can't come see you. She begs me to come. And you told her you were a doctor. Officer Nelson, you have to believe me. I would never have done anything to her. Okay, you know, Maurice, I, I'm just reading your chats and, and you know, you're talking about being concerned for her and you're asking her, will you suck me? And uh, I want you to taste me. After providing the officer with just about all the information he'll need to convict him, he decides to ask for a lawyer and end the interrogation. I can only imagine what his lawyer said to him after seeing this recording. When can I speak to an attorney? So, so at this point, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, I mean, what can I say? Okay. He's escorted out and taken to the jail where he finally gets to make that call to his wife. Hi, honey. Bring a $30,000 check to the jail, please. Honey, I'm in big trouble. I'll explain you have to bail me out of the Sonoma County Jail. $30,000 check, we need. After a two-year legal battle, Wolin eventually pleaded no contest and was sentenced to two months of house arrest and three years of probation and his name was to stay on the sex offender registry for the rest of his life. His medical license was also revoked. Unfortunately, he makes the next monster on our list seem like a choir boy. Oh, okay, I might not be going home then. Elizabeth Wetlaufer. Our fourth case involves a Canadian woman from Woodstock, Ontario, who admitted to killing her patients after checking into a drug rehabilitation program on September 16, 2016. After she confessed to the hospital staff, they noticed the Toronto police who eventually charged her with eight counts of murder. Elizabeth sits in an interrogation room where she prepares to talk about her 10-year killing spree to a detective. Before she gets into any detail about her crimes, the officer wants her to be clear about what the ramifications of this interview could be. There you go, I remember all that. I remember all that. So I, I know I read you a few things before, um, as we were kind of just cruising down Spadina there. Um, and I know you've been read this many times, but it's just things that we need to just reiterate and, and make sure that you're clear and comfortable with, okay. with having this conversation today. Okay. Okay. Because she suffered from bipolar disorder, it was important for her to express that she had a clear understanding of what she was about to do. Like I said, um, based on our investigation, there could be some, some pretty serious criminal charges that result of, yeah. of our investigation. Okay. Yeah. So having said that, if, if you wish to speak to a lawyer, at any time. Okay. After waiving her right to speak to a lawyer, she seems cheery and almost excited to speak to the detective. So okay. whether it's now, five minutes from now, an hour from now, or three days from now, whatever the case may be. We're not going to be asking questions for three days, are we? I hope not. I hope <laughs> okay. not. I'm, just, I'm just saying that any time that you want to speak to a lawyer, that you're kind of in our company or whatever the case may be, you let us know and, and we can make that accommodation for okay. you. Does okay. that make sense? Okay. Elizabeth explains what her position as a healthcare worker entailed and why she did it. Saint Elizabeth was my priority. Okay. So, and lifeguard is very much you pick up the shifts as they come. There's very few scheduled shifts, so I can say the yes and no to them and, and focus on Saint Elizabeth. She's open about her addiction to medication and how she got it. From the detective's perspective, the interview must have been off to a perfect start. I was a binge user. So I would use what I could get a hold of okay. by stealing it from the patient. Okay. All right. And how would that work? Like, would, it, would it just be in their, in their allotted medications, or would you have access to a card to, um, to feed your there dinner? Some, <clears throat> there's some in their allotted medications. So her plan is to stop drinking and join AA. If that's her plan, she may not be able to understand what's happening in that room. If she keeps talking, she's likely never going to see the outside of a correctional facility. That's my plan. Well, that's, that's good that you have a plan. What do you think? What do you think the reason is that you slipped into the addiction back in the week? What, 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 um, is it just the stresses of the job that you're facing, yeah, or dealing yeah, with just, your personal life as well? And just always feeling like I had to be the best possible person, and very, very stressful job, giving medications to 32 people, um, making sure treatments were done on 32 people, right. charging procedures 32 people supervising four PSWs who sometimes didn't always get along and sometimes always didn't always get along with me. The detective attempts to make her as comfortable as possible by asking her about her family and personal life with the hope she'll trust him enough to keep talking and incriminate herself. Well, they're, they're quite active. The oldest one is 26 and he's got a, a wife and two kids. 
Have you been out to visit at all at Benner Beast? Or? Um, I've been to see their house once. Yeah. They've been here a few times. Nice. They came in 2013 for my parents and um, my nephew and his wife stayed behind and lived with my parents for a few months while my nephew tried to go to Bible college. So your brother older or younger than you? Older. The idea of being influenced by a supernatural or godlike entity is something that many serial killers have expressed. It allows them to believe that their actions are not only beyond their control, but they're justified because they're allowing their victims to escape their trauma or pain. But I just, uh, I didn't want this to keep going on, so I quit both jobs. Looked into where I could get help. Dr. Fernando is my uh, psychiatrist. And he's not a very nice man. So then I started researching some uh, psych boards and stuff, and I saw CAMH. And they are the only um, mental health facility in Ontario that has an emergency department. Okay. So I made a decision, and I went, I went there one Friday morning. I took the train, and off I went. She starts to admit what she's done, but it seems that she believes doing the right thing after the fact may be the most important thing, and may even exonerate her. She seems confused and unaware. As far as you know, have, have these people reached out to any of the police agencies where they may reside to, to notify that you told them this? Or no. did you tell them in, in kind of confidence? And, and I told them in confidence and they, they said they promised me they wouldn't tell anyone. Okay. But basically the, the implant was if I didn't get help. Right then they'd be on the phone the next day. Okay, I got you. So did you tell them basically then on I told them the like, Thursday? I told them the night before I went. Okay, so yeah. Thursday night? Yeah. And then you took it off Friday morning? Yeah. Admitting that she expected people to keep her secrets for her shows that she really doesn't appreciate what she's done. She's burdened people close to her and made them possible accessories after the fact by not going to the police with the information. Okay. So that's basically what they said was, you know, if you haven't gotten help Friday, then we're calling the police. We love you, but we're calling the police. They probably felt that they had an obligation, right? Yes, yeah. Maybe yeah. a moral obligation or however they saw it, right? Yeah. She gives the name of one of her victims, and the detective becomes confident it'll lead to more. So he stops her and explains how important it is for her to provide every detail she can remember. The detective is about to get her to open up about her first confirmed victim, James Silcox. And tell me about your, your knowledge of, of James and, and your daily interactions during a shift with him. Um, I didn't see him every time. He wasn't always my patient. I just knew from what uh, people had said that he would grab the, the nurse's uh, breasts and buttocks and... He would say horribly inappropriate things about his wife that now he was there, you know, um, he was going to f*** all of us, she was going to f*** all of us, stock, and just would say inappropriate things. And he did touch me inappropriately once. And where was that? On my breast. On your breast, okay. And were you alone in the room at that point? Yes. Yeah. Elizabeth admits that James wasn't the first person she attempted to kill with an overdose. Next up was Helen Matheson, who Elizabeth says wasn't a diabetic. The detective was curious as to how much insulin it would take to kill someone. Um, the next person on your list is Helen Matheson. Yeah. Okay. Helen, I don't remember a lot about. She was very quiet, very determined. Just seemed to be waiting to die. Mm -hmm. Again, I had that feeling that, you know, this is the one. Mm -hmm. And, um... I made a bit of a fuss about her that night because she was very lucid mm -hmm. and we talked about how much she liked blueberry pie and ice cream. Okay. So on my, on my break I went to uh, Walmart, I got a small blueberry pie and some ice cream mm -hmm. and brought it to her and she ate three or four bites yes. and then that night I overdosed her. She admits to being filled with laughter while injecting her victims and after they passed away. Laughing and cackling becomes a common theme. When would you feel that laughter? Would you feel it right after you injected it or once the person passed away? Um, both. Yeah. And then the laughter afterwards, which was really, it was like a cackling from the pit of hell, if that makes sense. The detective expands his interest and asks if she got to know any personal details about her victims. Is there anything else you remember about her at all? Not really. Well, he was a big game hunter. Was he? Yeah. And he had pictures of it all of us in this room. Yeah. After more than two hours of interrogation, the detective asked if she could remember anyone else. 
he might not be going home then. That might be the understatement of the century. Is there anyone else that you can think of right now? No. No? See where the next steps are. Oh, okay. I might not be going home then. I will get back to you with that. Okay. Um, She's asked one more time if she understands what they've just talked about and the seriousness of it. Okay. You understand what I, what we just talked about? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Because it's a very unique situation, right? Yes. Yeah. Where so you confess to, to certain things. Yeah. And we have quite a bit of like, work, as you can imagine, yeah. to um, piece this investigation together and see where we go from here. On June 26, 2017, Elizabeth Wettlaufer was sentenced to eight concurrent life sentences with no chance of parole for 25 years. She chose the elderly as her victims, but the victim in our last case is a four-month-old baby. So then we'll go back and we'll discuss it at the interview room, and then from there you'll be released to the jail, okay? Amanda Hickey. Police responded to a 911 call after a 30-year-old Georgia woman named Amanda Hickey reported an unresponsive baby at her home, daycare in Dunwoody, Georgia, on February 3, 2021. After Dunwoody, police and rescue teams show up at Amanda's Little Dovey daycare. The mother of the infant rushes into the scene. Her go in the ambulance with them. Scottish right, ma'am. Get... Go in the ambulance right there. They're, they're getting ready to go. This is mom. This body cam footage shows the officer racing up to the house. He has no idea whether the baby is still alive. First responders perform CPR in a desperate attempt to revive him. Hey guys, right here. Breathing? Still CPR? Yep. All right. Face down in the bed. He's laying face down in the bed? Yeah. Yes, right. Clear. Analyzing heart rhythm. Amanda explained to officers that she panicked when the boy wasn't breathing and called 911. She said she placed the boy on his back, but the investigation provided evidence that she had actually placed him on his stomach. I put him to bed on his back, but his parents say that he could roll over, but I had never seen him. What time did you call 911? I can show you. Um, I was quite... Looked out. So I, I, di I, di I dialed it. And then I think I just kept hitting it. And then I think this, this was them calling you, me this back. Three, As evidence is collected from the room where the boy was found, an officer reveals that he was found face down in the corner of his crib. It wouldn't even matter how the officer said the boy was found since Amanda willingly provided security cam footage that showed the boy lying on his stomach. I noticed you have cameras. I do. They record 24-7. Um, I believe so, yeah. Or is it just motion? That's a great question. I'm not positive. Okay, that's okay. Would we be able to access those? I think so. And get the footage? Like the, fa like the families don't, it's not like something that I share with the family that's a clue. No, yeah, yeah, no, I understand. She said that it was the mattress pad, but it looks like it's... There's no pad in there. I know. That's what I said. But she said that's what he was sleeping on. They're all like that, though. I didn't want to manipulate it. So no. I haven't that's... touched it yet, but he was found face down in that corner, top left corner. Uh, she put him back and he, she says he must have rolled over, but they do have a camera in here. I got it. Right there. It's like it's not gonna, is he gonna capture that? I don't know. She's upset, but not as upset as the mother of the little boy. Amanda and her family are first told that there's no suspicion of wrongdoing. I don't know what to tell them either. <laughs> Tell them a baby had an emergency and... I can, I can escort you out any questions. They, I can answer those questions for you. Okay? Okay. We, can, we can do that for you to help it's you out. It's gonna be really hard for you to talk to mm -hmm. Really hard. <laughs> uh, a baby had a medical emergency. <laughs> so you didn't do nothing. I haven't found anything today that leads towards any type of malicious intent. You know, I can say that. As of right now. And I don't foresee that on this. But just days later, police return and place her under arrest for second degree murder. She's loaded up and taken in for questioning. She chooses not to discuss the issues with the officers. Hey, Miss Amanda. Can you step out here for just a minute, please? You are being placed under arrest. Okay. Okay. Do you want to talk to me? If so, we can go back to the police department and we can talk. If not, you're going to go straight to the cab jail. Yes. You do want to talk to me? Yes. Okay. So then we'll go back and we'll discuss it at the interview room. And then from there, you'll be released to the jail, okay? She's eventually booked into county jail to stand trial for second-degree murder, reckless conduct, and multiple counts of cruelty to children. She entered an Alford plea, meaning she maintained her innocence but accepts that she'd likely be found guilty at trial. She was sentenced to 35 years in prison, with the final five years served as part of her probation. I hope you enjoyed this video, and don't forget to subscribe for more.